What's up guys, CJ here with Elevated Systems. Today we're diving deeper into the M2 Pro Mac Mini and its editing capabilities. I've been putting this little machine through its paces over the past few days, and I'm excited to share my findings with you. If you're looking for biased opinions or sensationalism, you've come to the wrong place. Instead, I'll be taking you through one of my real world video projects in DaVinci Resolve Studio, comparing the Mac Mini's performance to my base model Mac Studio and a similarly spec and priced Windows PC. We'll also crank up the complexity with some fusion compositions and demanding effects to see how well this mini Mac holds up against more expensive and power hungry systems. Let's do this. It's the money. Before we jump into a timeline, let's quickly go over what contributes to the project. First, all the footage was shot on my Blackmagic Pocket Cinema 6K Pro. The video format for the B-roll footage is full frame 6K Blackmagic RAW 50 FPS with a 5 to 1 compression ratio. The A-roll is B-RAW 8 to 1 29.97 FPS. All of it's filmed using the Gen 5 film profile. The footage was captured directly to a 1 terabyte Samsung T7 USB-C SSD. My editing setup includes an LG 40 inch ultra ride 5120 by 2160 main display for the timeline and project and preview windows and an NOCN 16 inch 4K OLED display for media pool and effects as well as a full resolution broadcast display for accurate full DCI P3 color grading. All displays are using full native resolution so there's no scaling demand on the GPU. There's a Behringer USB DAC for my microphone, studio monitors, and headset, a Blackmagic speed editor for the initial cut, and a multifunction mouse and Keychron keyboard for finishing work. I'm also using the Max HDMI output to capture the full resolution main display on my laptop. As always, I'll be editing directly from the USB-C drive I recorded to. A quick drive speed test shows my read speeds are fast enough for B-RAW all the way up to 12K DCI 24 FPS. So more than good for my footage. I'm using the latest version 18.2.1 of DaVinci Resolve Studio and a 4K 2997 FPS 16 by nine timeline. I'm working in a full resolution timeline and I'm not using any proxies and I have all the render caching disabled. After populating the clips and B-roll bins, I grabbed my speed editor, jumped into the cut tab, and very quickly laid out my initial A-roll edit. Now, this was pretty smooth, however, I did notice several very small stutters, which can definitely disrupt the speed editing flow. Once the initial edit was laid, I moved to the edit tab and started overlaying B-roll. Dragging clips into the preview window, marking in and out points, and dropping them into the timeline went without a problem. Most of the 50 FPS clips are retimed to 60% to match the timeline and give us that nice slow-mo. There's a music backed montage in this video and I was able to preview it along the way in the timeline in real time to easily ensure all the timings were hit. In fact, I was able to preview the entire timeline in real time. The only thing the Mac mini had problems with was fusion transitions, which is pretty common for most systems. Once the B-roll was all laid in, I moved to Fairlight, changed the track to a mono, normalized it, opened up the dynamics panel to apply just a bit of compression and to bump up the levels. I added a slight limiter and some gate to clean up some of the background noise. Next, I equalized the track to bring some richness back into the vocals and reduce some of the reverb. And finally, I added a de or filter. I've typically never had problems working in Fairlight, which continued here with the Mac Mini. The next task was color correction and grading. For all the A-roll, I selected my color card clip and began laying in the nodes. I do have a custom LUT I use for my videos, but I forgot to load it before disconnecting my Mac Studio, so I'm just going with the generic Cinema 6K Film to extended video LUT. From there, I added nodes for lighting, contrast, color correction, and finally grading, which for this video, I'm just pumping up the saturation a bit. Once it's good, I lay in an adjustment clip above all the A-roll and paste in the correction. From there, I do the same for the first B-roll clip and then copy that into all the rest of the B-roll clips and individually tweak each clip as needed. Typically, as long as I set the white balance on my camera, it just involves adjusting the lighting levels as needed. 
Again, no issues. Changes made in the nodes were instantaneously reflected in the broadcast display. No delays or lag as I adjusted settings. Now, just for assessment, I added a moderately light noise reduction node to a single clip at the end of the timeline. Switching back to the edit tab, I was still able to play back the fully edited and color corrected timeline in real time, only significantly dropping frames at the fusion transitions. But this time it did stutter a little through the standard resolve transitions. The montage still played through, but as expected, the noise corrected clip significantly hung, but I was still able to play the entire timeline in real time and catch and correct any errors before the final output. Once all the corrections were made, it was time to render and I'm going with my standard H.265 profile MP4 container and a set bitrate and added it to the queue and it rendered in 8 minutes and 21 seconds. Now while DaVinci Resolve is logically well optimized for B-RAW footage and handles it pretty easily, once you start adding correction nodes, effects and elements, it does get demanding and you need more than a basic laptop to process it, but still, this was a moderately light project for the M2 Pro, so let's turn up the complexity a bit. I'll start with some fusion compositions. The first one is a new animated 3D stinger. Building the nodes and working in the 3D viewport was very smooth. Node setting changes were reflected in the render view in real time, but I did notice the lighting seemed a little too harsh or the contrast was off. It's hard to explain, but you'll see what I mean a bit later. Other than that, I was able to keyframe both the text nodes and camera and smooth the animation splines. The animation played relatively smoothly in the render view. When it was done, I added it to the timeline and added fusion transitions to the beginning and end. Next, I converted a clip to a fusion clip so I could add an animated callout. I tracked points and locked the coordinates for both the callout target and title points. The tracker usually fails if I add the callout before the tracker, but here it worked flawlessly. In the first clip of the montage section, I rotoed out the computer and used it to mask out an animated text element. Again, keyframing the mask spline and text was smooth and I was able to move through the composition frames with no stutters or sticks. The last fusion element I created were a couple of fusion clips to trace the CPU and SSD with animated splines. For the CPU trace I just used a single keyframe spline and for the SSD I used a double spline for a slightly modified effect and I added a fusion title to the clip. Again, both had zero problems in the fusion studio and the clips preview relatively well in the timeline. Finally, the most demanding process I included in the project was using an object removal node to remove the background light in the opening clip. I splined out the light and clicked scene analysis. The removal wasn't perfect, it usually isn't on the first attempt, but it was fast. I've used this technique to remove things like boom mics and cleaning rags from my shots before and I know close enough is usually the best you can hope for, so I just built the clean plate and moved on. Back in the timeline, this type of unrendered clip usually becomes unplayable, so the fact that the play had moved at all was pretty impressive. Now, talking to other Resolve editors, one of the main reasons they use Resolve other than the subscription fees and instability of Premiere is the ability to take lower quality footage from cheaper point and shoot cameras or cell phones and make it look really good with the tools like sharpening and noise reduction. I use both of these tools a lot with my old camera and I still do when I throw in a quick b-roll shot I grabbed on my phone. For this video, I added an adjustment clip with a moderately light sharpening node over all the b-roll in the timeline and because the closing clips were shot in a dark room with no set lighting they were pretty noisy so I copied the denoising node from that one clip to all of them. Now at this point with all these comps and effects in the timeline playback is very choppy which is why I do this type of work at the end after the timeline is set but because the workflow in Fusion was smooth I'm pretty confident in the overall results. So I rendered it out using the same settings as before and it finished with no problems but did take almost three times as long. Now it's time to swap out the $1300 mini for the $2000 studio and see how it compares. I imported the simpler version of the project first and began by just scrubbing through the timeline which the studio did effortlessly. 
Playback performance was also markedly better, with the studio being able to play right through even the fusion transitions without dropping a frame. Now, one of the small issues I had with the Mini was the slowdowns I encountered while using the speed editor to lay down the initial cut. So I quickly jumped into a new project and repeated the process. Just as it has for the past 10 months, it cut up and laid down the footage without a single stutter. I can shuttle through this entire timeline as fast as I can spin the dial. Now, for full disclosure, I have the T7 drive plugged into the front 10 gigabit USB-C port on the studio, which actually gives me slightly slower read speeds than the Mini's TP4 port did, but that didn't affect performance at all. So time to check the render speed. With the same HEVC profile, the studio rendered the project in five minutes and two seconds, or about 40% faster than the M2 Pro Mini. Loading in the more advanced project, while noticeably better than the Mini, even the M1 Max couldn't smoothly play this timeline, but I was able to render it in 13 minutes and 39 seconds. That's less of an increase in render time than the Mac Mini had between the two projects, and ended up being 10 and a half minutes faster than the Mini's rendering of the project. But now let's see how the PC I built does, importing the first project and unexpectedly, the timeline scrubbing and playback was on par with the Mac Studio. Once I saw it play through the opening stinger and two fusion transitions without dropping a frame, I was impressed. It hit all the basic transitions easily, the montage with the transition overlays wasn't a problem, and while this is purely objective, it even appeared to play the noise reduce clip the smoothest of all three systems. Resolve timeline performance was one of the main reasons I switched from a PC to a Mac, and it looks like the cheaper PC is performing on par with my Mac Studio. Loading in the same render settings and using the NVIDIA coder, and the PC rendered out the project in 7 minutes and 17 seconds, 2 minutes and 15 seconds behind the Mac Studio, but over a minute faster than the M2 Pro Mini. Is the third time the charm? Have I built a dollar for dollar PC that can out video edit an Apple Silicon machine? Well, let's load up the second project and find out. And right off the bat, the timeline performance was again on par with the Mac Studio and better than I expected for this mid tier PC. I also rebuilt the 3D test animation and fusion on the PC and it was just as smooth as it was on the Mac. However, even though I was careful to use the same positions and settings for the lights and text as I did on the Mac, you may notice that the lighting was much more subtle and realistic looking here, giving much better contrast between the lit and shadowed surfaces. We definitely have a higher quality render viewport on the PC. In rendering performance, the PC looked like it was starting out bad, but once it got through that first object removal clip, it cruised through the timeline, Unfortunately, at about the 17 minute mark and almost at the end of the render, it failed. I reset and loaded the render again and this time it froze at the same location. It just couldn't seem to make it through those final noise reduction nodes. So I tried to render the final sequence in place and discovered the problem. There just isn't enough VRAM in the RTX 3060 Ti to process those 6K clips with that level of effects. Maybe I should have gone with the RTX 3060 12 gig, but the memory bus is cut in half on that, which can also lead to its own slowdowns in this workflow. Plus, the Mac Mini only has 16 gigs of system memory total that it shares with the CPU and GPU. Now, I did try to render it out using the native CPU render engine, and it also failed. Now, while just like the Mac, the NVIDIA card has an HEVC encoder built in, H.265 is a more challenging codec, so I switched to the default YouTube 4K H.264 preset, and it also failed in almost the same exact place. Finally, I just gave in and removed all the noise reduction from every clip so I could just get through the render, but this time, Resolve just crashed. I reset and tried again, but I couldn't even get the render started before the program crashed. Now, with time, I could probably figure it out and make the necessary adjustments to the project to get a final render, which I guess is fine if video editing was just a hobby, but like most semi-professionals, time is money. Now, despite what I'm sure to see in the comments section, I didn't set out to design a project to fail on the PC. PC hardware is probably 80% or more of what I cover on the channel, and as a PC enthusiast, 
and having actually built the system, the fail stings more than a little. But while maybe not all in the same project, these are all composition and effects types that I use in my normal workflow. And I switched to Mac and Apple Silicon because it just performs so much better in my workflow at a lower price point, which still seems crazy to me. Now, I could stick a new RTX 4080 in here and probably kill the render, but if a single component of the system costs more than this entire system, well, that's also a loss. On the upside, if your workload looks more or less like the first less complex project, which most of my videos do, then the PC did outperform the Mac mini at the same price point, but the room for growth in your edits seems more limited. The good piece of news here is when comparing the M2 Pro Mini to the M1 Mac Studio, I can honestly say that I'm not convinced the 53% price increase justifies the level of performance increase I saw. The one deal breaker for me would be the speed editing performance of the M2 Pro. Even subtle little stutters really slows down the process. However, there are solutions for this. While creating proxies for all 97 clips or over 800 gigabytes of the project footage is not an option in terms of time and extra storage capacity, proxying out just the three A-roll clips, which was about 82 gigs of footage to ProRes 422LT only took four and a half minutes. And I could lay that into the timeline as fast as I could spin the dial. So for editing projects that are in line with this tier of hardware, you could go with either of these machines and aside from render times, not see too much of a difference in overall performance, or at least not at a level congruent with the cost increase. But what do I mean by projects that are in line with this tier of hardware? Well, I shoot on a $2,500 camera, so a $1,300 to $2,000 editing computer is reasonable and balanced. I'd get a lot better performance with a $4,000 M1 Ultra Studio, but that's like pairing an RTX 4090 with a four core i3 CPU. It just doesn't make sense. I get a lot of questions like, how does it handle 12 bit 8K Red Raw or 12K 60 FPS clips? And my answer is, if you're shooting on a 10 to $50,000 camera setup, why are you looking at a mid-tier Mac or PC? Anyway, to wrap things up, the M2 Pro is a beast of a machine for editing, even for more demanding projects. Now, I bought the Mac Studio 10 months ago and I'm happy with it, but if the Mac Mini was available back then, it would have been a tough decision for me. But hopefully the info I shared in this video will make that decision easier for you. The final version of the project I was editing in this video will be up on YouTube in a few weeks, but you can check it out now on my Patreon page. And if you wanna support the channel, the link is in the description below. And while you're there, make sure you hit that like and subscribe buttons so you don't miss the next episode in the Mac mini series, VFX and Blender. If I remember how to do VFX and Blender, but for better or worse, I hope to see you there.